Welcome everyone to our one of another sessions of um, the Energy and Environment um, webinar series. Uh, today we are very lucky to have uh, Professor Mark uh, Barrett, um, who is a professor in Energy and Environmental uh, System Modeling um, at UCL, and he's going to be talking about a 100% uh, renewable UK with a focus on heat. Um, the way that uh, we are going to do this session is as usual. Um, we are going to have around 40 minutes of um, talk uh, by Professor Mark Barrett, and then we will be uh, giving space to the Q&A um, section. In the meantime, if um, during the presentation, you come up with some questions, you can use the Q&A box uh, that is on the lower part of uh, your screen. And I will be asking uh, those questions to Mark um, when he has finished his presentation, okay? Just to let you know that we are recording this um, session as usual. Um, so it is available uh, for some people who haven't been able to come um, today. Okay, so with uh, no further delay, I would like you to um, welcome you, uh, Mark. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you, Nelia. Um, well, good afternoon, everybody. Unfortunately, my voice is very weak at the moment, so I hope you can hear me all right. Um, so um, today I'm going to uh, tell you a bit about some research we did, which was funded by the CREDS uh, programme. And um, <clears throat> a lot of the research was done by Tiziano Gala Casarino, my colleague, who's now at Bayes. So let's get on with it. Um, the aim of the work was to design zero emission systems for the UK with a focus on heat and test whether the designs actually work in engineering terms and determine their costs. We designed nine systems with different building efficiency, shares of heating and capacities of renewables and stores and interconnectors. And we modeled this with uh, the Estimo model um, to model the uh, uh, performance of the system hour by hour over long periods of time, up to 35 years. <clears throat> the central problem we have in energy system design is um, that we have varying demands here driven by people's activities and by the weather. And we have variable renewables here, which um, change hour by hour. And so the problem is to match the renewables to the varying demands with storage and transmission. We always start with energy service demands. Um, and you can define that as the minimum energy required to perform a task. We look at four sectors, domestic services, industry transport, and eight different energy services, each with their own uh, characteristics of use patterns and so forth. All service demands are different, driven by hourly social patterns. We get up in the morning and do things, so we use more energy. Some of the demands are independent of weather, such as computing, for example. But heat, a large fraction of heat is dependent on the weather as well as the use pattern. So the ambient temperature and solar radiation uh, and the characteristics of how the building is used and the heat loss factor. And uh, just to note that um, vehicles are really buildings on wheels, so they have space and cooling loads as well. So here we see the example of um, Estimo simulating uh, a winter's day. So we have our four sectors here. And for each sector, we have these different end uses, for space heating and so forth. And we see how the demands for energy are change across the day, with generally more demand in the daylight hours uh, and evening, rather than in the middle of the night. Now those demands, and here we have our end use sectors, 
the four sectors. And here we see a picture of a national energy system, which really is in three parts. One is demands here. And the other end of the system is primary energy. So we have our renewable electricity here, and we have fossil and nuclear. And we also have trade across the national border with other countries. And in order to meet the varying demands, we've got this complicated system in the middle there, for transmitting energy from supply to consumer and for converting it and for storing it. So here we see in this system, if we take electricity here, it comes through and it goes direct to consumers for different purposes for electric, including heating. Some of it here goes to heat pumps in our district heating scheme, and then the heat is distributed, transmitted to consumers. And the other thing we look at is the use of hydrogen, which is made with electrolysis here, and again, it can be piped to consumers. So are the three basic things that we look at. But we also look at um, the use of hydrogen for making ammonia for ships, but we don't yet look at aviation fueling. And you can see there's stalls scattered through the system. There's electricity grid store here, district heat store, hydrogen store, ammonia store, uh, and electric vehicle battery storage. <clears throat> and this system is, has to be controlled such that demands and supplies are balanced uh, hour by hour. This system actually extends um, to international scale. And in the work we've done, um, we've looked at five regions of Europe, GBR plus North, South, East, West Europe. And we look at the instantaneous trade between these regions. So where there's a, a deficit in one hour in one region, you might be able to supply it with a surplus from another region. So we actually model each of these regions uh, at the same time, so we can look at the uh, interconnection. And we've found in previous work um, that that can uh, reduce storage by up to 30%. Um, the system control algorithm <clears throat> basically, first of all, try to meet your, your demand locally, and then you trade surpluses and deficits, and then you use stored fuel if there's still remaining demand. <clears throat> there's a lot of detail here, but the, um, the PowerPoint can be made available and there'll be a recording um, so you can read at your leisure. These systems operate within uh, meteorological systems. And in particular, the ones we looked at was the effect of temperature on demands, on wind speeds and solar radiation. And these data are available at half degree latitude longitude globally. Then the temperature and solar data were weighted by population for demand and solar modeling. And the wind speeds were used at wind farm locations for generation modeling. Now, historic weather, of course, isn't future weather. And so we've tried to account a little bit for climate change. And um, the, uh, the Met Office uh, have projections with as much as uh, uh, four to five degrees increase in temperatures <coughs> by um, 2060. And of course, this has consequences for comfort, heating, cooling, and renewables, and variability in rainfalls changing. What impact will that have on hydro and biomass? Heat demand in the UK um, is estimated from heat emitted from boilers and so on, but that's not all useful. And heat currently accounts for about half of UK energy CO2. Future demand will be affected by population and economic growth and efficiency. Roughly half of heat is for space heating and about 17% for water, and the rest for processes and so on. 
um, most heat demand is in the domestic sector, but it's still substantial in the other sectors. <coughs> heat demand, of course, isn't constant. It varies with social activities and weather. So here we see um, three days of heating. <coughs> Excuse me. And here we see it across three years hourly. The high high demand in the in the um, in the winter and low in the in the summer, and also the electric vehicle demands also change with the weather. <coughs> And uh, our primary supply, I'm going to have to ask you to read this. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, wind and solar vary, hydro some storage, nuclear fairly constant. So we have to match these varying demands with these varying supplies. Um, <coughs> Excuse me. Um, when we design systems, we've got all these options for efficiency, conversion, supply mix and storage mix, and interconnectors. So we have to try and find good combinations of these for a good design. <coughs> We tried to use resources and technologies currently in widespread use, like renewables. We assume no, nuclear, no new nuclear beyond Hinkley and no fossil fuels. <coughs> Biomass is reserved for kerosene production for aircraft, which is something we haven't studied closely yet. The three main heat technologies we assume are heat pumps, electric heat pumps, district heating, and hydrogen in boilers with electrolytic hydrogen. But many other technologies can produce heat, um, for example, solar, geothermal, biomass, and so on. <coughs> A heat pump, um, could be uh, use ground source or, or uh, air source. And um, to note that reversible heat pumps can provide both heat and cool, and therefore <coughs> give you some re resilience to climate change. And here's an example of a reversible heat pump there, you can see in the bottom right, which is a bit like fan heaters um, stuck on your wall. <coughs> And we can have storage in the system. And um, another thing to mention is uh, personal comfort systems, which are things like heated furniture or cooled furniture, which reduces your heat or cool load in the building. <clears throat> then we have district heating, which is a flexible multi-heat source system. Um, so it has heat storage in it and multiple sources. Here we have heat pumps, geothermal, boilers, and CHP. <coughs> and when we have a surplus of renewables, we can run our heat pumps. When we have a deficit, we can use our storage. So that's shown in this chart here. So you can see uh, CHP coming in there uh, and heat from storage coming in the night there and a little bit of heat from the boiler. So it's a very flexible system, which helps you manage the whole system, the whole national system. <clears throat> so we looked at uh, three core heat shares, 70% district heat, 70% consumer heat pumps, and 70% hydrogen, with a balance made up <coughs> by consumer heat pumps or, cons or uh, district heat. Then we looked at variants um, with high and low generation, more, more insulation and so forth. <clears throat> and the, um, the amounts of storage we need change with the different heat shares. 
and uh, the capacities of renewables also change in these variant systems. These last two systems is where we're looking at climate change with plus two and plus four degrees centigrade. <clears throat> Um, the total heat demand in the core scenarios is similar to today's demand, but you can see here's the space heat demand. It falls dramatically when you have climate change plus two and plus four degrees. <clears throat> we also see that building insulation has an effect on the on the heat demand, space heat demand here. I do apologize for my voice. <clears throat> when we ran our climate change scenarios, <clears throat> we found that we see this reduction in space heat here, but we see a, an increase in air conditioning. And although we didn't model this very uh, in very much detail, more or less, <clears throat> your space heat load is balanced by the increase in air conditioning as the weather warms up, <coughs> which has implications for reversible consumer or district heat and cooling heat pumps, which can do both, whereas hydrogen boilers can only heat. Climate change will also, of course, mean less heat in the winter, but more cool in the summer and change the optimal capacities of wind and solar. <clears throat> um, here we're looking at the uh, renewable capacities of on and offshore wind and PV and hydro and nuclear. <clears throat> and you see uh, you need quite a bit, hundreds of gigawatts. And you see that because hydrogen the overall efficiency of converting electricity to heat with hydrogen is about 65, 70%. With a heat pump, it's about 300%. So you need much more electricity for your electrolytic hydrogen than you do for your heat pumps. And this has consequences, of course, for the capacities and the costs later. Then we see here <coughs> is the actual generation, which more or less reflects the capacities. Um, you see the nuclear at the end there is, is, is negligible, so I can't quite claim it's 100% renewable, but pretty close. One of the interesting things we found in our designs um, was that with trying things out and by uh, optimization with a separate simpler model, it's cost optimal to spill 40 to 50% of the generated uh, electricity uh, from solar and wind. <clears throat> this is quite surprising, of course, but we could decrease the capacities of the renewables, but then we'd have to have more storage or more interconnectors. And so we have this juggling act between these three principal ways of balancing storage interconnector and renewable capacity. And uh, this is where we, we, we need more work um, to optimize. <clears throat> Wind and solar costs have fallen by about 70% in the last 10 or 15 years, and more reductions are projected. So they become rather cheaper compared to storages and interconnectors, which are well-known technologies uh, in the main. But even uh, storage battery costs, for example, have come down a lot too. The systems we have all are net exporters, i.e. negative imports, so they export electricity into Europe. Um, <clears throat> these charts show um, in this first chart here, this is over three years of uh, simulation, and it includes 2010, which is the most difficult year in terms of meteorology i.e. quite cold and low renewables. And we see here at the top, 
this is actual the flows of heat. But at the top here are our storage levels. And you can see that generally the storage level stays high and it only reaches the bottom uh, once or twice. Um, similarly, that's for heat storage and our district heating. Similarly for hydrogen storage, it stays high, but drops down to very low levels, to zero here, um, just a couple of times across three years. It's the same story uh, for electricity, uh, which is down here. <clears throat> So um, our storage, most of it is hardly used for most of the time, uh, which obviously is a problem um, in terms of cost effectiveness. But um, as I say, we could decrease the storage that we need, but then we'd have to increase the interconnectors or renewable capacities. <clears throat> And here you see this nice chart, um, which Tiziano did. And um, up here we have our wind and solar capacity. And across here we have our total storage. And you can see, as you increase the renewable capacity, uh, as you increase the new renewable capacity from a low level here to a high level here, you need less storage. It shows that balancing act. <clears throat> Systems um, we use have uh, between about uh, 10 and 20 total terawatt hours of storage in vehicle batteries, heat, grid storage, hydrogen and ammonia. And again, um, you can see you can see the uh, amount of storage here. So here, here we have low renewable capacity and high storage. <coughs> Um, then we calculated the costs of the whole system. And um, so here we have the total capital cost in billions of pounds of the system. We annuitize that to get annual capital costs and then operation and maintenance to get the total system cost, uh, <coughs> total annual system cost in billions of pounds. One interesting thing about this is that the operation and maintenance costs are about a third of the total annual cost, which I found quite interesting. And you can see again here, because hydrogen needs so much more electricity, um, that um, here's the total capital asset, it's not annuitized, or the annual cost, you see that the highest cost is hydrogen. That's for 70% heat with hydrogen, 30% with consumer heat pumps. And here we see the um, electricity costs. So this is the cost just for the electricity system. <coughs> and um, here we have a consumed uh, cost for electricity um, and the generation cost here. Surprisingly low, but uh, the offshore wind, we, we use projected costs by base, for example, for wind, where they're projecting less than 1,500 pounds a kilowatt for offshore wind. And the astounding thing is that the capacity factor is six over 60% projected. And they're now making giant wind turbines that achieve this capacity factor. And that changes so much. The higher the capacity factor of wind, the less storage you need. Um, this is another way of presenting the costs. So they're accumulated across the system. So here we have the cost the consumer has to meet. Here we have the intermediate system costs for our um, hydrogen production, district heating, uh, ammonia production distribution and transmission of electricity and so on. And here we have our primary costs for wind, solar, hydro and nuclear. And what's interesting is that um, these two lines here are uh, hydrogen district heating, have very, really quite low consumer costs. A hydrogen boiler probably cost about the same as a gas boiler. 
connection to district heating is a small cost uh, at the consumer. Um, but the uh, consumer heat pump does cost quite a lot. So rather than costing maybe two or three thousand pounds to install a hydrogen boiler or district heating, you're talking maybe ten thousand pounds for an average typical dwelling. But as you go across the system, these costs converge. And particularly then they diverge as we come to the primary production end of the system, where because hydrogen needs so much more electricity, its primary costs are much higher. So that's a theme really uh, for the comparative costs. Um, <clears throat> So then we can express these costs uh, in terms of a cost of heat. And uh, our main focus in this work was on uh, renewable zero emission systems. <coughs> but we also looked at um, using natural gas for heating. And I'll come onto that in a minute. So here we have the sort of bottom line for the costs here. This brown line is the pence per kilowatt hour of heat. And we see that uh, we estimate that um, district heating and uh, consumer heat pumps is around 10 pence a kilowatt hour for the heat, whereas um, hydrogen is more like 18. And the reason is <coughs> the main difference is the much greater cost of the electricity, both for the generators, but also for the transmission uh, 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 capacities. We see for the consumer heat pump, this large uh, consumer fraction of total cost and electricity a little bit more than district heating, because it's a bit less efficient, the district heating, and you need to spend more on your distribution network, your electricity distribution network uh, with heat pumps. And here we have our district heating with the consumer part and these other costs for the network and district heat storage. Um, we also did some analysis, but not with an estimo, uh, less detailed, looking at the use of uh, natural gas. And there are three possibilities that we thought we looked at. One is to make hydrogen with natural gas. But because um, natural gas supply to the UK has upstream emissions of CO2 and methane, we have to balance those emissions for net zero with carbon capture which is this cost here. And this cost here is gas. And of course, we know at the moment what reliance on gas imports uh, might threaten our energy security. Um, and in fact, what we looked at was um, a natural gas using um, <coughs> fueling CHP and district heating. Um, and because it's much more efficient, you need to balance it with less direct air capture and you, overall you get a smaller cost. But these costs are very, very sensitive to two big unknowns, future gas prices and the future costs of direct air capture, which is really not a proven technology at the moment. Oops. Um, <clears throat> so this is more commentary really now. Um, um, the security and resilience aspect of these systems. Well, hourly demands are met over 35 years of weather. So that's quite a good test. But of course, um, and, and there's no fossil or biomass energy import during that time. And on balance is net electricity export that should read. We've tested a bit uh, with resilience to climate change, how that will impact on demands, and to note that reversible heat pumps uh, can heat and cool, which hydrogen boilers cannot. Of course, there's still possibilities of widespread electricity failure, because of, for example, transmission faults, cyber attack, or really adverse uh, environmental conditions such as occurred in Texas not long ago. 
Nuclear capacity is very small, so its risk to the system is low, either because of fault at a particular nuclear power station in the UK, or perhaps a generic fault uh, leading to the uh, reduction in output of nuclear stations because of a, uh, an element somewhere else, uh, a, a, an event in some other part of the world. Um, we might want to ensure against extreme meteorology uh, with high demand, low renewables. So for example, we might build 100 gigawatts of natural gas turbines, maybe uh, as uh, part of district heating CHP, um, and that would add about maybe uh, two to four percent of the annual system cost, so quite small. But gas storage would additionally be required. And it was, we, we, we know at the moment uh, how little gas storage we have, maybe five days. But a possibility would, of course, be to uh, retain um, uh, 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 natural gas reservoirs uh, for storage, you know, so that we can run these gas turbines. I don't know, for 40 days or something. <clears throat> so um, the summary is uh, we've designed nine zero emission systems. They use uh, current commercial technologies, albeit with future cost reductions, it, with the exception of hydrogen boilers and networks. Currently, you can't buy a hydrogen boiler, as far as I know. And uh, there are no instances I know of of large scale hydrogen distribution systems and the adaptation of natural gas to hydrogen on a large scale. Um, the systems are zero emission. Um, they meet demands hour by hour across 35 years with and without climate change. Of net exports. We found that uh, hydrogen heating has higher primary energy needs and therefore costs than consumer heat pumps or district heat. Uh, all of the systems will require major changes to consumer and public supply systems. And finally, um, it's not claimed that the systems are the best designs, the cost minimum designs, but simply that they work in engineering terms um, and we've calculated the costs. But as they say, further work is needed um, to improve these designs. Now, <clears throat> we didn't look at um, implementation issues, but um, there's a question obviously, as is in the news today and always, how fast can the installation rate of heat pumps or district heating be ramped up? given the required skilled labour financing and so on that is needed, and what regulatory or market measures are required. We did not model or analyse that here, but I'll just make comments about the uh, rates of change just to maintain the capacities in net zero systems are shown here with the lifetimes. So we need to be installing, you know, maybe, uh, to over 2 million heat pumps a year just to maintain the system once we've built it. Similarly, really, for district heating and hydrogen. Of course, we have to go faster than that if we want to get to a, a, a zero emission system, let's say by 2050. That's a very short period of time, given that uh, most of the boilers in the last 15 years, so that's going to restrict turnover rate. We've been very successful, however, in um, building up our renewable capacities over the last 10 or 15 years in the UK. Astonishing progress, actually, and astonishing cost reductions. But nonetheless, um, we see that we, we need to install maybe 10, 10 gigawatts, 10 to 12 gigawatts a year in the district heating and heat pump scenarios to maintain the capacity. And we need to go over 20 in the hydrogen scenario because we need so much more electricity. Um, and there's a little summary really of heat, the heating systems here. <clears throat> Just to summarize. Um, so our heat generator, here we have heat pumps, district heat and hydrogen. It's reversible, possibly heat pumps uh, and a hydrogen boiler. So they can heat and cool, and that can only heat. So 
the things which are problematic to the technology are highlighted in red. Primary, renewable and nuclear. <clears throat> we need to produce hydrogen, so we need electrolyzers. And the overall ratio of heat output per electricity input is low for hydrogen. 100% greenhouse gas reduction. <clears throat> um, boilers produce NOx, hydrogen boilers produce NOx. That may possibly be an air pollution problem. Um, heat pumps tend to uh, produce external noise with the evaporators. That may be problematic. And there's other impacts like condensate from uh, heat pumps. And for the electrolyzers, you need water and chemicals. Uh, um, so they have impacts there. In terms of space, probably um, the heat pump requires external evaporator space and internal inside the building. <coughs> and, and these constraints can limit um, these constraints um, limit uh, what we might do. So for example, for tower blocks or uh, uh, big terraces of houses, there may not be space um, to put uh, a heat pump evaporator so that it uh, doesn't cause too much noise. Consumer capital cost. Uh, the problem here is uh, heat pump, high capital cost, uh, the high cost of heat from uh, hydrogen. And what experience do we have? Well, there's millions of uh, heat pumps and district heated, uh, district heated consumers in, uh, in, in the UK and Europe together, whereas there's really no none for hydrogen heating, very tiny numbers. And finally, um, district heat and hydrogen, you have to install by area, whereas the advantage of a heat pump is you can install one by one. So as your gas boiler dies, you can replace it with a heat pump. Um, so the next steps we're thinking about, looking, which I, I won't say much about, one is including aviation fuel production for biomass, carbon, hydrogen, electricity, looking at negative emissions to produce the carbon for aviation fuel, more detail on efficiency of insulation, uh, personal comfort systems and, and costs, uh, hydrogen for iron production, um, to include domestic air conditioning and district heating and cooling. Um, and maybe look a bit at building storage, energy storage, passive storage, active thermal and battery. But this, these stores will never be very large um, because of size con uh, space constraints. And we'd like to develop better design procedures uh, and a, a rather heroic extension maybe to West Asia and North Africa with the transmission and trading so that you can um, do more smoothing of demands and renewables across a large area. <coughs> so um, there's a paper which seems to uh, coming out by, by Tiziano Gallo Casarino and myself. Um, you can see the title there. That's been accepted for publication um, and hopefully it will take less than a decade for it actually to come out. It's so slow. Um, I wrote the first version of Estimo and Tiziano extended it hugely and made it operational. He's a computer scientist, so he left me behind really. And the work here, a lot of it was prepared by Tiziano. And anyway, if you if you have comments or would like to discuss the work uh, one on one or whatever, uh, our emails are there. Do contact us, um, um, and I think there'll be recording of this presentation, and we could make the PowerPoint available um, to you as well. So thanks very much for listening. I hope you heard something of what I said. It's terrible. I've got I've got a whole ten frogs down my throat. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mark. Um, sorry about your uh, your throat. Uh, I think that many people are suffering from the same. But yeah, when you have to give a presentation, is um, is more difficult. Um, has been great to see such a comprehensive study. 
Um, I'm going to give a pass now to the questions. Just to remind you, use the Q&A um, box that is on the bottom uh, part of your screen. And also, if you would like to ask yourself, you can raise uh, your hand and we will <clears throat> let you to, to speak. The first question that we have from David Toke uh, was roughly how much less total heating will be needed under your energy efficiency scenario compared to today? Well, um, <clears throat> projecting future heat demand is very difficult because um, on the one hand, buildings will gradually become more efficient. <clears throat> Pretty much the last 50 years has seen failure of deep retrofit of insulation to our building stock to existing buildings. I don't anticipate um, that changing very much. So the efficiency will gradually improve, but at the same time, um, population, some population projections are for much higher population, increasing number of households and older population, which may change. So I don't anticipate great changes in uh, space heat demand uh, because of these counter countervailing factors. Okay, um, let's go to first to the questions posted to the Q&A and then we'll be uh, giving the word to the people raising their hands. Um, the first one was, uh, what role do you see for <coughs> dynamic pricing to manage demand to limit the size of peaks and supply capacity requirements? Um, this is um, a very, very difficult topic. Um, First of all, to say that um, with a student of mine and a colleague, uh, we wrote a paper on pricing, or rather the, what the marginal costs of systems are with renewables and storage. And that's quite complex just to work that out. Now, when you come to dynamic pricing, um, you want to reflect these marginal costs to an extent. Um, which is limited by uh, what effect it may have on fuel poverty, for example. But basically we assume with the control algorithm of Estimo, uh, which I can come back to if you like, um, with the control algorithm Estimo, we basically, given the system that we have uh, that's in place, the algorithm uh, tries to make minimize the use of fossil or biomass fuels. So now the degree to which dynamic pricing would affect that control algorithm through some dynamic bidding market is one of the great unanswered questions that we have at the moment. Um, so um, I, I, could, I could send the, the paper to Mark, um, but, but we think through the algorithm that we we reflect dynamic management and pricing would play a part in that, and that's a pretty useless answer, I'm afraid. Uh, it's the it's one of the most very difficult parts is control of the system and what the pricing might be. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Peter is asking why has wind generation capacity factor increased? Is this just an assumption? Um, there's very good reason why wind generating capacity as factors increased. Number one is uh, the move of generation to offshore. And offshore wind speeds are much steadier and generally higher than onshore wind speeds. So that's one reason. The second reason is that um, the offshore wind turbines are now giants, hundreds of meters high. I mean, I can't remember now. 200 meters maybe to the hub of these wind generators. And the further, the higher the wind turbine, the steadier the wind speed and the faster the wind speed. So a study was done by uh, an outfit for Bayes, and that is the capacity factor that Bayes themselves assume for future wind, offshore wind. This is being extended because now we we have um, uh, prototypes for floating wind turbines. And there's a, again a discussion about filling up the North Sea with wind turbines and energy islands and so forth. 
So the capacity factor will increase hugely. In fact, in fact, if you look at offshore wind capacity factors, which aren't reported, then you'll see uh, these higher capacity factors. Thank you. Uh, Callum is um, asking, uh, would it not be cheaper to forget about hydrogen for heating and just using it for ammonia, methane and methanol? Well, I absolutely agree with that. Um, I, think, I think we've shown hyd electrolytic hydrogen is a very expensive way of heating and you need to build a lot more wind turbines and solar PV to make it. Um, we, res we restrict ammonia, um, assuming that that is used for ships, but it could be hydrogen. Um, we don't assume anything about methane and methanol because you need carbon for those. And uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a low carbon emission world, where does the carbon come from? So <clears throat> we think um, for fueling aircraft, some of the carbon to make synthetic kerosene uh, would come from biomass, but there's probably not enough. So you'd have to supplement that with carbon and carbon captured from the atmosphere and hydrogen. Uh, we also think about using ammonia um, as backup for CHP in the, in the district heating scheme. Thank you. Uh, David Barnes is thanking you for the presentation and is asking if is there a role for seasonal thermal storage uh, to balance heat demand in any of your scenarios? And there is a second part of the question. If you can expand on this or if it was not included, what was, were the reasons behind that? Um, well, all the work we've done, um, and that includes uh, something I haven't presented here, <coughs> which is optimization, um, shows that um, you maybe want, you know, two or three weeks of heat storage in your district heating, but, but not seasonal heat storage. But again, it's the fact that as wind capacity factors and costs have come down, then the uh, cost effectiveness of storage has decreased. Um, and, and, and it's as simple as that. But we have looked at uh, seasonal storage, but I also have a, um, a PhD student who, who who is looking at that, and he comes up with similar um, similar quantities of heat storage, uh, much smaller than seasonal. Thank you. I'm going to be passing now the word to um, Bob. He has raised his hand, um, so you can. Unmute your microphone, Bob. Okay, can you hear me? <clears throat> yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Uh, Mark, I just wanted to say uh, that was a great presentation, uh, really excellent, um, uh, showing the work that you've been doing uh, over uh, what the last, I'm not quite sure where to start, 40 years, three years, something like that. Uh, it's a movable feast, but it really was very, very interesting uh, and some great insights. So I'd just like to thank you for that. Um, uh, I really enjoyed it. Thanks very much, Bob. Thank you. Okay, so if in the meantime, if there are, uh, well, Kai, uh, or head of the <laughs> okay. Energy and Research um, Division. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much, Mark, for an inspirational talk and uh, also with lots of technical details. It's, it's, it couldn't be more timely uh, in the world of uh, transition towards uh, uh, carbon neutrality. Um, you, you have noted that the hydrogen option is more expensive. Um, in, um, in your um, uh, estimation, how, how did you... Um, uh, what, what do you uh, propose to generate uh, hydrogen? What, what was the, um, what was it, were the well, technology probably? Technology? Um, it's basically um, yeah. an electrolyzer, Kai. And mm. um, uh, <clears throat> well, that's it. We took um, generally the technology performance and cost data came from a Danish energy technology database mm. with projections again for 2040. And um, 
well, so, so I mean, I could show you, but um, I think I think the efficiency was assumed to be seventy five percent, but I've forgotten the cost per kilowatt. Um, of course, there's many different kinds of electrolyzer types out there, um, but we just assumed a sort of generic one, if you like. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I, I also I will... I've had a good look at making hydrogen from methane for natural gas. But the emissions are just too high. Mm -hmm. So I think it's uh, basically for zero emission or net zero emission, you really can't use any amount of fossil fuels mm -hmm. um, because it's so difficult to balance them. Mm, and sure. even in a 100% scenario, let's say you're making aviation fuel with biomass and atmospheric carbon, then um, when you burn synthetic kerosene at high altitude, it causes global warming for the aircraft because of cloud formation and NOx formation. And so you have to balance that with negative emissions somehow to get to net zero. Mm. Aviation is the, um, is the killer sector to try and sort out. Mm. Mm. Sure, I, I agree with that. There, there are no um, ready solutions to that problem. Um, on the other hand, I think uh, aviation is probably accounting for about, is it 4% of the CO2 emissions? But it's small or? currently. Yeah. But of so, course, as the rest of the economy decarbonizes, it's going to grow very that's rapidly. Right. That's partly right. because the rest of the economy is decarbonizing. But also, we still have a growth rate. Um, we'll see after the pandemic. but. We also have, we have a growth rate of 5% per annum or something like that for aviation. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, <clears throat> you can do a year's global warming in about three hours in an aircraft flying. Um, mm -hmm. So, so, so the, the possible expansion of aviation is really without limit, yeah. uh, more or less. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so in your best estimation, uh, if we now start to move to um, renewables, pure renewables, um, what would be the annual cost to the UK? Um, let's say the extra cost, because usually we, we have to invest in energy, you know, even for fossil fuels, we have to invest billions of pounds in, in in energy technologies. So what's the extra cost of moving to renewables? Um, well, I'm afraid, Kai, I, I haven't worked that out. Mm. Um, because in a way it doesn't matter because mm -hmm. you've got no choice. You can't carry on using <laughs> oil and gas. And, mm -hmm. um, and of course, the other thing I'd say is, well, which gas price would you use? <laughs> mm -hmm. This is one other thing about uh, renewable systems that, that we've designed here, is that um, they're all capital costs and operation and maintenance costs, <laughs> virtually no fuel costs. And so you're really you not exposed to the problem of varying oil or gas prices as we have uh, over the last, well, I don't know, five decades in the UK. Um, so, so, um, so my answer is a a. What what oil or gas prices do you assume for the comparison, and b you've got no choice anyway. <laughs> Can I uh, continue? I have a couple of questions myself um, because um, first of all I'm understanding that uh, from that diagram that you were explaining with the strategy, you have the sources and then you have the middle bit, the pipeline, and then you were getting to uh, the end users. How do you establish the priorities um, in that middle line? And as you were talking about um, having the, this strategy implemented in different locations, I'm assuming that then those priorities are going to be shifting depending on wherever is, um, is available in a certain location, it's not going to be the same France as UK yeah. or, or yeah. Austria. Um, can you see my slide? Yes. Yeah. Well, um, we've written a 
global optimum dispatch algorithm, God, God for short, which has perfect knowledge and control of the whole, whole system. Um, and um, basically, first of all, you try and meet your demands within your local national system. Um, and you see the process there, you calculate demands and uncontrollable renewable and inflexible nuclear generation. You try to use that electricity to meet directly demand. If you have surplus, um, you put it into storage. And there's detail that's not in here. If you have surplus electricity, do you, do you put it into a grid store? Do you use it to make hydrogen? Do you use it to make heat in your district heat system or ammonia? And so there's a very complex uh, decision algorithm in there, um, which, uh, as I said, I, this is the most challenging part of it all. And then once you've met your demands locally as far as possible, either directly or by taking energy out of the different stores and then storing a surplus, then the next thing is if you still have surpluses and deficits in the nodes, you then look across all of the nodes at the same time and you see where the surpluses and deficits are and you trade those surpluses and deficits via transmission, international transmission now. Okay. Um, and then finally, if you still have remaining demand, you're going to use your stores of biofuel or natural gas or, uh, uh, um, or yeah, or biomass. And um, what we've aimed is that um, we never get to part C. Our systems never need to use uh, primary biofuels or natural gas. Um, so that you don't have the problem of, uh, of absorption. But this is, uh, this is like pricing. This is the most difficult part of the modeling, actually. It's quite easy to make assumptions about how an electrolyzer works or a boiler. But deciding where you put your surpluses first is not easy. This I actually, I think... This is the most challenging part of the modeling. Yeah. Yes, I can imagine, and it will depend on the policy of each country as well, because they prefer to favor some technologies rather than others. Yeah, well, um, well we're, assuming, we're assuming that God controls the whole European system. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we have uh, time for one last question, and that is coming from Manish uh, in the Q&A box. Uh, he's um, thanking you for the very good presentation, and he's saying that you mentioned the need of uh, for two meter heat pumps per year. Um, has there been any feasibility studies around this? And thinking about new piece today, uh, about 90K heat pumps in the UK, does that seem too little or yeah. okay for you? <clears throat> Well, as I said, um, the figures I gave for 2 million heat pumps um, are, that's, that's just to replace them as they die. So this is assuming we've got all heat pumps are installed. And then if there's say 3 million of them <clears throat> in domestic and uh, uh, other buildings. So let's say you have 30 million consumers and the average life of a heat pump is 15 years, then you need 2 million a year just to replace them. It's an envelope calculation. But of course, the problem is if you want to build up to having 30 million heat pumps in 2050, let's say, you not only have to replace them as they die, <coughs> you have to add to the stock of heat pumps. So you need to build even faster. So 90,000 heat pumps installed a year is enough to feed a flea. It's, uh, it's, it's negligible. And this is the problem, whether it's heat pumps or district heating or indeed hydrogen boilers, how fast 
Well, hydrogen boiler is less problematic. How fast can we install these systems? And to do that, you need skilled labor force who are going to do it to high quality. And we simply don't have it in this country at the moment. In other countries uh, like district heating in Scandinavia or heat pumps in France and so on, they install far more than we do here. But this is the major challenge actually, is installing consumer systems is the main challenge that we have. And that's the end of our, our uh, seminar. Um, uh, thank you very much, Mark. It has been great to having you with us. Um, thank you for your talk and uh, for making available in case anyone would like um, the slides. Uh, I'm just going to uh, say goodbye and I'm looking forward to see you in our next webinar. Uh, uh, it's going to be on the 5th of November and we will be having Angkor uh, from Imperial College. Thank you, everyone. Have um, a good rest of the week. Bye. And thank, and thank you for listening and for all your questions. It's very useful. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you, Lenny. Okay, bye, bye bye. Bye. Bye.